Hello, I'm David Myers. I teach Jewish history at UCLA and I'm a member of the Faculty Advisory Committee of the UCLA Levy Center for Jewish Studies. I'm pleased to welcome Professor, Professor Leora Halperin, whose book, The Oldest Guard, Forging the Zionist Settler Past, will be the subject of our discussion today. Leora Halperin is an Associate Professor of International Studies, History, and Jewish Studies, and the Jack and Rebecca Benaroya Endowed Chair in Israel Studies at the University of Washington. In addition to The Oldest Guard, she is the author of Babel and Zion, Jews, Nationalism, and Language Diversity in Palestine, 1920 to 1948, which came out in 2015 from Yale University Press. She received her PhD in history from UCLA in 2011. So welcome back, Leora. Thank you. It's great to be back. Right. So Leora and I will be joined in conversation today by Avery Weinman, who is a doctoral student in the UCLA Department of History and the Harry Sigmund Graduate Fellow at the UCLA Nazarian Center for Israel Studies. Welcome to you, Avery. Great, it's great to be with you guys. Thanks for having me today. Good, so let's jump right into our conversation, Leora, about your book, The Oldest Guard. Can you help us understand where you position yourself as a scholar, especially among researchers of Zionism? What's distinctive about your approach and really what are the questions that you and others of your generational cohort are asking? Yeah, thank you for that question. It's it's really great to be back in the place of my forging, <laughs> to use that word for my title, as a, as, a, as a PhD. And it's just great to be interviewed by you, David, and also by you, Avery, whose work is, is so interesting to me and so exciting. Um, well, you know, um, I, I feel like I've been influenced by and I'm building on several um, historiographies, um, some of which would be classified as histories or historiographies of Zionism, and some of them not. Um, and I see myself working in the in interstices of, of, of various of these subfields. So I guess I'll start, I'll start by saying that maybe most broadly within the field of the history of Israel or history of Zionism, there's been now a multi-decade movement away from what had historically been a focus on labor Zionism towards an interest in other currents of, of thought. Um, most of the other work in that field dealt um, specifically with currents of thought, so sort of alternative visions or theories of Zionism. Um, looking at that development in the field, though, it made me realize the extent to which the apparently non-ideological um, circles of, of, of Jews in Palestine who would have identified as Zionists but weren't forwarding you know, theories of Zionism had remained relatively untapped. So that was one, one point of, of intervention. Um, I'm certainly building on a scholarship on the history of capitalism in and around Israel-Palestine, um, within which people like Derek Penzlar and Nahum Karlinsky are, have been important pioneers, um, but I'm also in conversation with a more emerging, slightly more recent interest in the history of capitalism from Middle East studies scholars who focus on Palestinian um, businessmen, owners of capital, um, sometimes in connection and collaboration with Jewish owners of capital. So Mustafa Kabha and Shireen Saikali, um, Kristen Alf um, are some of those scholars. Um, certainly, uh, interested in work on Zionist memory, right? This is a work about commemoration and, and the making or envisioning of the past. And so Yael Zrubavel's work, also Nurit Gertz, um, on kind of the bigger tropes of Zionist memory are really foundational for me. Um, but I found that they were not as interested or engaged with the more deeply embedded study of particular communities and counter memories. Um, and also it seemed to emphasize, you know, the ancient, um, the ancient past with Zionism as a vision of return to an ancient uh, glorious past. Um, and also an interest in, in heroic death or her heroic casualties, rather than what I was seeing being an interest in, um, you know, survivors um, and um, kind of the rhetorics of, of settler survival. Um, I can also point to the, the trajectories in the history of, of cultural history within the Zionist field or the history of Zionism field, Mizrahi Jews and Jewish actors. Um, the move towards more comparative scholarship, some of which takes the story transnationally, um, and some of which, and which is where I see myself, 
looking actually at a very locally framed story, right? A very narrowly framed geographic space, but thinking comparatively in my analysis, which is something I'm sure that we'll get to. Um, but, but when we talk about settler colonialism, um, the people who tend to work on Israel-Palestine um, are, are often more present oriented or certainly post 48 oriented uh, and not as interested in cultural history or some of the kind of internal dynamics of the Zionist movement. So I feel like I'm bringing my interest in those kind of inside or insider stories into a much bigger um, comparative or theoretical conversation. Avery? Right, and I think with that kind of meta background in place, the historiographical, historiographical background, this is a good opportunity to jump to the fundamentals and the essentials of the book, which is what is the labor Zionist, or not the labor Zionist, what is the first Aliyah narrative? So what are its features and what differentiates it from the labor Zionist narrative? Um, also perhaps on this thread, what common traits does it have to other excluded narratives that we're seeing um, are emerging or perhaps nascent first time interest in historiographically, um, particularly there I'm thinking about revisionist Zionist histories, Palestinian histories, and also Ottoman Sephardi histories. Sure. Well, so I identified a few different themes. There are really two that, that go through the text of my book. One of them is what I call the rhetoric of hierarchical coexistence, which came from the fact, it's a really foundational fact in terms of the place of the first Daliyah in um, the history of, of Zionism, uh, which is that they rejected, they being the owners of these private owners of agricultural lands, rejected either in full or in part the labor Zionist premise that they should stop employing um, Arabs as agricultural workers and should employ only Jews, right? They should be committed to providing employment for immigrant Jews. Um, so as a result of that historical fact of continuing to hire Arabs for most unskilled labor, really well into the 1930s, um, private um, landowners tended to cultivate employer-employee relationships. Now, they weren't always good relationships. They were um, exploitative relationships in many cases, but from their standpoint and certainly their retrospective standpoint, they uh, saw these as the basis for a, a form of coexistence, right, of getting along that had been destroyed by the labor Zionist commitment to firing those workers and replacing them with Jews. Um, so more generally, they were opposed to kind of the vision of communal separation um, in e economics and then also ultimately in, um, in politics that would define labor Zionist visions. Um, another feature of the first Aliyah story or the commemorative story is what I call the politics of apoliticism. Um, and I should say, I didn't mention this in my rundown of fields that I feel that I contribute to, but I've been noticing just the number of scholars who in different ways have been pointing out um, uh, the, the ways in which certain forms of Zionist politics have been particularly um, persuasive or important, or in some cases disregarded because they presented themselves as occurring outside of the sphere of politics. Um, uh, those sorts of visions tend to be associated with those who um, see themselves as pragmatists, as moderates who are engaged in investment, um, various forms of capitalistic or ownership activities. So in this case, um, we're talking about owners of agricultural lands who claimed kind of who made both a diachronic claim and a synchronic claim, I would say. One is that they proceeded, right, having settled in the 1880s and 1890s, they preceded the Zionist movement per se as a formal set of, of instruments for settlement and management of land, um, and therefore existed outside of and in fact prior to the politics and the the, the skirmishes and intense intra-partisan squabbles of the Zionist movement and were simply committed to Jewish economic productivity and unity. Um, on the other hand, we have the synchronic dimension. So even as that partisanship ramped up and only increased over the course of the mandate period, and of course still persists today in Israeli politics, they presented themselves as outside of those partisan politics. Um, Partly they came to that position because they never became especially politically organized, though there were some efforts and um, were 
maintaining their influence because of their economic importance. So their, their importance vis-a-vis -vis the British was in their um, leading role in the export um, industry industries of, of the Yishuv and with respect to the Israeli government after 1948, because agriculture remained, at least in the early years of Israeli statehood, a very important area. Um, and so this kind of politics of apoliticism was about skepticism towards Zionist institu institutions and political parties, even if they supported the top line kind of visions of, of Jewish revival and unity. And also the idea that they represented an era that needed to be celebrated, but in fact was being forgotten, um, despite its commitment to these trans-political or trans-partisan um, values of unity. It also struck me that if we're assembling a list of ingredients to make up the recipe of the, the first Aliyah narrative, that there are a couple of other important traits that characterize this specific memory, this specific um, way of thinking about the past that is different, perhaps, than labor Zionism. And I thought um, one of those was individualism, and specifically an individualism that is antagonistic to state control. Here we're seeing really this veneration of a rugged hero narrative um, in which the individual by proxy of their interpersonal relations has more capability than the state could ever dream of having. Um, that's something I think we see also that is a strong overlap in revisionism. Um, on a similar note, we see an obsession with the deed, which is this vestige of vitalism, which is its actions and not talking, its doing and not thinking, that is really the core of the Zionist ethos. And something that was unexpected, but that I found really fascinating, was their penchant for religiosity and traditional Jewish religious practice, um, something that really differentiates the first Aliyah crowd from the, the second Aliyah labor Zionist crowd is the frequency with which they're still in synagogue and the frequency with which they show their Shabbat. And this is still very much part of their life. Um, so I'm wondering what you think of those perhaps additional traits. Yeah, you know, and I'm glad you mentioned them because um, those were also on my list of, of things to mention is that, you know, if we think about, I think wrongly think about early Zionism as a story of socialism and collectivism, we're forgetting about this, um, current of settlement and also an ethos around settlement that was really deeply personalized and localized, right? Because the lands or the individual parcels of land were owned by individuals in many cases, um, that person's individual role in settling that place and that house takes on a different kind of heroic place than somebody who may be associated with heroic deeds, but not in their kind of act of physical settlement itself. Um, and I think this is a way in which we discount the parallels that exist between Zionist settlement and other settler societies. Sometimes there's this assumption, well, there wasn't that kind of rugged individualism, right? Or the, the insistence on private enterprise. Well, in fact, there was. And you start to see that kind of ethos um, emerging. Um, the issue of re religiosity, absolutely, right? These are people who thought that commitment to the Jewish people as a, a modern national group was not inconsistent with commitment to traditional religiosity. And in that sense, they kind of blur the boundaries between what we might see as the old Yishuv, right, the kind of religious non-Zionist population of Palestine, very much stereotyped by the Zionist movement, and Zionism, right, as a historical enterprise. These folks really saw themselves as, as, as in, existing in continuity with that past of religious affinity, Yishu Veret Israel, the settling of the land of Israel as a religious value, but also attaching all sorts of tropes of national pr productivity and revival. Um, and I think you're right. I didn't answer your, your first question about these other currents of forgotten um, <laughs> for, forgotten or, or, or um, groups that felt neglected. Absolutely. Um, and this is, you know, something I found in my sources quite a lot that although first Aliyah memory or narratives were promoted first and foremost by these landowning classes, they found supporters from essentially all of the groups that you mentioned, Avery, in your questions. Um, Sephardi Zionists, revisionists, 
religious Zionists, even religious non-Zionists, kind of see in that story of settlement, whether it has to do with private enterprise, whether it has to do with religiosity, um, whether it has to do with Jewish-Arab relations, which is something Sephardi Zionists emphasized, right? They see something that they see as essential to their vision of Zionism that they can connect to. Um, and so although these groups are not in formal political alliance, um, there's a kind of proto-alliance um, even during the mandate period that we start to see around these narratives of the past and of Jewish settlement. Leo, I'm still interested in the genesis of the book. Um, your first book really took up a mandate era um, uh, period in, in the history of Zionism and Palestine. And here you extend back to the first Aliyah. And I, I'm just sort of curious, what was it about the first Aliyah that captured your attention? Maybe it was the personality of Avraham Shapira, a figure who recurs throughout your book, who captures this sort of transitional quality between the old Yishuv and Zionism, as it seems to be understood, certainly by the second Aliyah, sort of you can be a nationalist and religiously observant. Um, was it the pragmatic, pragmatic capitalism of this uh, cohort? Um, and its um, and its traces today in, in in Israeli society. What what actually was it that that said that called out to you? I need to study this. Yeah, well, this book really emerged in many stages, as 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 you know, David. It was not something where I had a research question going in that then became that that then I answered over the course of researching the book. It was a very idiosyncratic process after I finished my first book, which was about language and language ideologies. You know, I was kind of in a state of almost mourning. I thought, you know, I'll never love again. I'll never find a topic that I that I like so much as this one. And so not knowing what I was doing with myself, I set off on a, on a separate track entirely, which was doing research into my own family, the branch of my family, um, the great grandfather who had been born in Ottoman Jerusalem to a religious Ashkenazi family, one of these um, old issue of quote unquote families. Um, and I discovered that there were members of that family who had lived in, in um, Rishon Lutzion and Fetach Tikva. And I went to those local archives to see what I could find. Um, there was a murder case that I was for some years really interested in. Um, and so from there, I got interested in narratives of violence and then in memories of violence and then memories in general, and then on to first Aliyah memory. So it was really only as I started delving into to these commemorative documents um, that really had nothing to do with my family anymore, where I started seeing the ways that these local, you know, committees or anniversary committees were putting together their commemorative activities. And I realized that the story that I had read in my textbooks, you know, of the history of Israel, that, you know, there is this thing called the first Aliyah, and they tried a few things, but they were ineffective and didn't know what they were doing and were, you know, reactionaries. And then they were displaced by the, by the second Aliyah and sort of there ends the story of the first Aliyah. That that story was just entirely wrong, or at least it missed something very important, which is that the first Aliyah did not exist only as an object of denigration following World War One, but in fact was the object of great, um, you know, pride and local identity and even a kind of uh, political uh, self-fashioning of people who saw themselves as non-political. And so I realized then that there was absolutely a story to be told. And it was a story about the first Elia, but it was as much a story of the making of that memory, right? The, the construction of that concept into something distinctively positive in the minds of a particular class of people that is private landowners and also residents of particular places, which were the Moshavot or colonies that were created during this, during this first wave. And to some extent, even later uh, private colonies created by children um, of those earliest colonies. So, you know, I didn't start with the questions that I now would say were my research questions. In fact, all of the things you, you mentioned, David, you know, became essential questions. Like, what is this kind of non-ideological position? What are the labor relations that are contributing to these narratives of, 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 of kind of a centrist or center-right coexistence? Um, 
you know, what about the history of capitalism? What about the connections to settler memory in other societies? And I went down that huge rabbit hole, which in many ways I'm still in, just learning about the ways that settler societies, ones that are rooted in these stories of settlement, narrate their past. Yeah, I mean, it was a kind of juggling act to hold on to these two tasks that you just uh, just elucidated. On one hand, sort of the excavation of the untold story, which seems remarkable, of the first Aliyah, right? Really trying to understand who these characters were, like Avraham Shapira, and then the reception history, the way in which this uh, idea was remembered. So it was both forgotten and remembered, and sort of. Uh, trying to do the work of excavation and then trace that that uh, back and forth between uh, oblivion and and recollection. Um, that's a lot of juggling, and I'm just wondering how you sort of managed those multiple scholarly tasks. Yeah, it's a good question. I guess one is sort of a question of like writing and research methodology. Um, and the other maybe is kind of an intellectual question, but it's not easy. And I guess I've learned now that I've written two books that my mode is to proceed in very nonlinear ways in my research to, to, you know, really like write different parts and to keep developing the project as I go. It's certainly not the easiest way to write or to research. I don't necessarily recommend it to anyone, but you know, I found that focusing on certain figures became an important way to connect the dots. And you mentioned Avraham Shapira, who's sort of the Forrest Gump of this story. He's born in 1870 and doesn't die until 1965. So he's, he's alive for the entire historical arc of this story. Um, and he gets, right, he was an important historical actor in that 19th century period and then becomes an important actor in the commemorative events, both in Petah Tikva, where he lived most of his life, and also in, in other Moshevot. So following him provided a way to tell stories about that earlier past and then also bring out and analyze these commemorative exercises that were done much later. Um, part of it had to do with the history of, of places that I could that I could talk about the history of a place and I can also talk about different like kind of landmarks in the memory or um, um, commemorating of that place. So I could look at events, which are a less material type of commemoration. And then when I get to later eras, could look at museums and physical sites, kind of an infrastructure of commemoration that gets created. Avery. You know, I have a follow up on this theme and this thread that we're starting here, because it seems to me that this notion of the untold story is actually a big part of the story. One of the big arguments you make early on in the book is that it's this supersessionist function between the first Aliyah and the second Aliyah, meaning that the labor Zionists of the second Aliyah look back at the first Aliyah as something to negate and something to scratch and build themselves in contradistinction to. That is a key point ideologically, but I think what you've discovered by process of researching and writing this book is that that idea manifested itself physically in terms of historiography and archives. And so to return, I guess, to this idea of whose narratives have been excluded, um, how do you think this supersessionist impulse and the way in which labor Zionist hegemony in the state, the government, but also in literature and museums and poetry um, throughout the early years of, this, of the Israeli statehood, um, how do you think that played a role in shaping why it has been for so long that the first Elia story has gone largely untold by professional historians? Yeah, this, I think too, you know, I use this word supersessionist, which we tend to use in the context of talking about um, the emergence of Christianity and the relation of relationship of the church to Judaism or to Jews, kind of imagining that that Jews or Judaism had served an important, right, divinely mandated role in, in, in the history of human civilization, but then was um, wrecking or sort of rendered retrograde by the emergence of a more up-to-date vision, or in that case, revelation. Um, and yet kind of maintained a real fascination with that which preceded it, but still existed and developed alongside of it. And so, you know, for all the, the, the problems with any sort of um, analogy like that, I found it to be very useful for thinking about how um, the, 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 the second Aliyah, these late labor side institutions that became hegemonic, that structured um, the writing of history and the commemoration of the past, 
regarded you know, their, their predecessors, but who also were in, in many ways like still competitors, um, um, if not in political leadership, then certainly in economic importance or social status. Um, those are some of the most you know, rooted e economically important members of um, the mandate era issue of society. So one side of this story about supersession, I think I, I make this point in the introduction and I think it's important, is that one side of the supersession is to understand how labor Zionists kind of constructed the first Aliyah. In fact, they were the ones who constructed this periodization frame that created the first Aliyah, and they did so to elevate themselves and their contribution and to both recognize but also relegate to the past um, predecessors whose labor and economic models they, they rejected, right? So there's an internal dynamic. But the other, the other piece here, which is so important, is that this kind of internal rhetoric of, of, of supersession or resisting the narrative of supersession is that only the players within that um, within that dynamic are claimants to the role of first, right? If not chronological firstness, then historical primacy. And what that leaves out, and this is also true in the, in the case of Judaism and Christianity, is that it leaves out anyone prior to or outside that system, whether it's the monotheistic system, or in this case, the Jewish settlement system. And so in the case that I'm looking at, the, the case of Palestine and, and Israel, the communities who lived and made lives and you know uh, worked in Palestine um, for for hundreds and hundreds of years before the first Aliyah are either rendered absent or rendered very selectively visible, and that includes not only the Palestinian Arab majority, some of whom worked within the first Aliyah Moshevot, but also it includes various categories of Jewish natives who are both visible and invisible. So this is a group I refer to as the pre-first, which is maybe not the most um, felicitous, you know, phrase. It's a little awkward, but you know, within this iconic recognition and celebration of firstness, of Rishonim, of, you know, the first Aliyah, those who are prior to the first are erased, forgotten, selectively remembered, and that's also an equally important part of the story. Maybe just to pick up on this, um, the term supersession, um, as you hinted at, um, gestures back to uh, claims that Christians made about their relationship to uh, to Judaism. So it's uh, rife with uh, theological uh, consequences and repercussion, repercussions. Um, and at the same time, it's a term that surfaces and anchors uh, some of what we understand of as the paradigm of settler colonialism. And I'm just wondering, you know, how deliberate um, uh, was your invocation of that term, um, fraught as it is in multiple ways. Mm -hmm. And what do you want to convey? Um, sort of the, is, 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 is there a theological politics here or is this something that conduces to the settler colonial frame that we'll uh, spend some time talking about a bit later? Yeah, well, I think insofar as Zionism functioned and one might argue still functions as theology, as a, a source of, of faith and uh, object of, of commitment or betrayal, um, you can absolutely see, see that too, right? Like sort of what is the appropriate form of piety that a person or a community should be um, expressing? Um, but yes, you're absolutely right that the term supersession taken in, in the context of settler colonialism re re relates to the implied imperative of replacement of saying, you know, we represent the vision that needs to prevail. And those who do not either get with the program or get out of here um, are going to be persistently regarded as threats and either removed or legally um, marked in some way. So there's sort of the implication that what was there before needs to be replaced or it's not bad if it is replaced because there's this vision of productivity of a new kind of society that needs to be created. That's true broadly across narratives of Zionist settlement. What's unique in the case of First Aliyah memory is that it is not premised at least in, in, in its entirety on the idea of Palestinians or, or Arabs being irrelevant to the story, except as, as hostile, hostile actors, right? This rhetoric of hierarchical coexistence that I talked about 
also recognizes the existence, the reality, also the utility, the economic utility of um, Native um, Arabs as workers, and is not entirely eager to just say, oh, well, they were there and we chose to, to build a society that excluded them, right? Within this variant of Zionist memory, the, 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 the role of settlers in relationship to the natives was also to elevate their level of, of, of civilization, to improve their lives, to give them work, right? To make them um, receptive to the settler project precisely by helping them and making them um, even grateful potentially to, to the settlers for doing so. And so you see some real cognitive dissonance, especially after 1948, especially after um, most of those villages that provided that labor were depopulated and then destroyed and, and confiscated by the state, where you can see that broader kind of logic of, of replacement of supersession in that sense of kind of bringing the, the society that really should have been there into um, existence or to fruition, but also having this nostalgia towards the past, which also could be um, re, re, refigured or reimagined as an alternative vision of coexistence vis-a-vis -vis either the Palestinian citizen minority um, towards Palestinians more broadly or towards the Arab world. Right, and I think these themes that we're juggling right now of supersession uh, much have these idea of on the one hand erasure and that there's an inevitability that something needs to be replaced. And also this theme, like I've just said, of inevitability leads us to the elephant in the room, which we must now stare down, which is the theme of settler colonialism and how you used it in this book. So settler colonialism as an academic analytic what is it and why is it a good idea to do for Zionist history? And I'm also perhaps curious in these analogs that emerge with um, relationships to United States settler colonialism. Yeah. Um, and, you know, so I mentioned before that, you know, I didn't enter this project thinking, okay, I'm going to study Zionist settlement of this sort through the lens of settler colonialism. I, I arrived at it in, in quite an organic fashion as I observe certain patterns in the sources that I found and wanted to find comparative material to help me understand what was going on. And thereby I discovered the field of settler colonialism. Um, so I would say broadly speaking, settler colonial studies or this analytical framework has been applied to societies and nation states that were founded um, by settlers who came from a place they considered more civilized to a place that they considered in need of development or in need of um, revitalization, who hoped to create some kind of model society um, against the anti-models of their home countries, who regarded the local populations, the native populations, either as hindrances to their project, as potentially submissive helpers or assistants, and in certain cases, people who could be assimilated into the settler society and essentially made to become a sort of settler, even though they were not, even though they were native, native born. So another feature of these kinds of cases where this framework has been um, applied is the tendency of settlers to envision themselves as in fact the true natives, to become, right, to claim themselves as the true natives. This is where we get the word nativism. Right, which is often undertaken by those who date back to, to settlers. Um, and it's also a phenomenon that often results at some point in, in, in the history of the story in an anti-colonial struggle against an imperial power, um, which enables that group to form an independent state. So in each case, there's, there's different components. Not everything I just mentioned is present in every case, but, um, it became really clear to me when I was reading about the US, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, that there was obviously, right, parallels. There was obviously material that scholars in those fields had come to that was, that was relevant um, to my case, right? Because I was also dealing with people who were telling of making a home in a place that felt at the moment of their arrival quite foreign to them. People who felt fear of, native rural groups that were hostile to their being there, but also people who felt a lot of pride about creating a model society that could be a model to the world that could elevate, right, in their case, the Jewish people. 
So, um, you know, a few concepts from that field became important to me as I was um, thinking through my material, right? I figured that I would answer the question of whether settler colonialism was applicable to Zionism by applying it. So I wasn't going to be operating in some realm of kind of theoretical abstraction. I was going to apply aspects of that theory when it became relevant and thereby was going to you know, essentially test the question of its applicability. Um, so one concept that I found especially helpful was Jean O'Brien's um, concept of firsting. She has a book called Firsting and Lasting, um, which is a, a theory or an observation from um, archival material in New England colonies that settlers articulate again and again, articulate themselves as first, and the things that they do as the first of various categories of, of activity. And then by extension, articulate pre-settler forms of society as located either within a process of extinction, right? And this is what she calls lasting, which I deal with less, um, or assimilation, right? Somehow being integrated, whether fully or provisionally into the, the settler collective. And so, as I mentioned before, this notion of firstness, of rishoniut or rishonim, is everywhere. It's omnipresent in my sources. Um, and so, looking at this very different, right, temporally, geographically distinct case, helped me understand some of the ways that that firstness could both reflect a vision of newness, of being the first in a place, while also necessarily recognizing that they were not first. That not only were they in relationship to those who were already there, but are also interested in claiming continuity which that with that which was there prior which in this case of course is a Jewish past right a Jewish history within the land of Israel um, good I'm, I, I want to follow up on this um, and sort of understand the relationship between the settler colonial framework I guess to two things, I'm just thinking, I, I wanna understand what you mean by settler memory, which you talk about, which is sort of a discrete entity unto itself. But I also wanna understand um, how settler colonialism relates to, or better yet, how the lexicon that you deploy to describe the first Aliyah relates to and fits into the settler colonial frame. So I wanna just recall some of the terms and maybe you can sort of show the way in which they fit. Hierarchical coexistence, right? Mm -hmm. Which seems at some level to be consistent with a certain settler colonial view of sort of uh, conquest through assimilation or pacification. Um, but then some of the other terms that seem so central to your description um, and which I, I, to this day, don't know whether they're ironic or not. So maybe you can help me understand non-ideological, pragmatic, and apolitical. Mm -hmm. Are they used ironically, um, sort of set against or within the settler colonial frame or apart from it? You mean, do I use them yes. ironically? Yes, you use them ironically. Well, I do, well, I do in the sense that I, I, I state pretty explicitly that there is ideology, right? It, 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 inherent in their vision of what labor relations should look like and what um, the building of society should look like, or even what political future should look like. And of course, there's politics inherent in um, working to promote a Jewish settlement project and a Jewish economy, um, first under the Ottomans and then under the British and then within the state of Israel. So yes, I use them in, I don't know if I want to say ironic, but insofar as, right, I, I'm trying to indicate that I disagree with the assessment that these people were non-ideological and apolitical. But I also use these terms to recognize that their own self-understanding was as people who were not sullied or defiled by the kind of fracturing and negativity and high-minded but impractical um, idealism that they saw, especially in, in the labor Zionist world. So I'm trying to encapsulate there All of those you. things, including yeah. that exactly that last juxtaposition between sort of the lockstep ideological conformity demanded of labor Zionists and the relative um, you know, libertarian open sphere um, occupied by the first Aliyah folks, thereby warranting some measure of designation as non-ideological. So it's a very complicated mix. But I guess I'm just wondering, how does this fit into or does it into a settler colonial frame, sort of these uh, 
these descriptors that they deploy, is that part, do you see that as part of the settler colonial sensibility to assert a kind of neutrality, you know, and, and innocence and sort of uh, n not excessive um, uh, contrived quality to the presence? Yeah, well, it's it's based on an assumption that because the land that they have entered and settled in was underdeveloped or undeveloped or degenerate or wasteland, I mean, there's a variety of different words that are used, what they are doing to develop it, to develop themselves or their community on it is good, right? It is a good thing. And therefore, by being a good thing, by development being a good thing, it is also a non-political thing. OK, so I would disagree with that assessment. I would say, of course, it's a, it's a political thing, what they're doing, right? Reshaping a landscape, right? Affecting the economy of a place in ways that were right, really, really quite, quite drastic. Um, but because of that vision of it being just obviously good, right? Not the result of some political position that could be argued over, anybody displaced or inconvenienced or disaffected by those developments was simply acting irrationally, was you know, an enemy of civilization, was unaware of why they actually were benefiting. Um, and so um, this kind of apoliticism, we can see it also in, in, other, in other settings where the, the faith in one's mission is also really inherently linked to a denial of any negative outcomes, including lasting kind of embedded negative outcomes that emerge from that, from that project. So yeah, I think you know, this is a trope or a, a trend that we can see across a variety of, of settlement-based um, societies. And while we're on this thread of scrutinizing terms and also with dealing with the incongruity between the message, which is defanged in a sense of political with the reality of it being inherently political because it's a political message. Um, I want to take a closer look at the term hierarchical coexistence to figure out on what planes it's actually hierarchical. It seemed to me that in first Salia Zionists messaging, they had an idea of mutuality, that this wasn't hierarchical, but that it was symbiotic for both Jews and Arab laborers and not necessarily stratified along whatever lines. But then as I was rereading, it seemed to me that the hierarchy that did, that did exist uh, manifested itself most frequently through race and Orientalism. So in your words, why hier hierarchical and also why not something more, um, more neutral in a sense? Well, I was using the term to think about just the inherent power relationship between an employer and employee, which is the relationship that is most central to what I'm describing as this rhetoric, like right? a person who controls whether another person will feed their family or, um, you know, be able to care for themselves um, and that they are, you know, essentially selling their labor in order to, 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 to survive. Um, so that's the hierarchy that I'm describing. Now, how is that hierarchy justified? It's justified, as you say, on the basis of certain assumptions about what the role of certain categories of actors should be within this kind of system. Um, and lest I make it seem that we're simply talking about Ashkenazi um, Jewish landowners and rural Palestinian Arab Muslim peasants, Right. There's also all kinds of other actors within this hierarchy, most notably um, the group that after 48 would be called Mizrahi Jews. At that point, it's mostly Yemenite Jews, but it's not only. There's also Jews of um, various Middle Eastern backgrounds who serve in, in roles as guards within the colonies who um, have a kind of an intermediate place because these are individuals who are regarded as subject to assimilation into the project, right? These are people who could and perhaps should be brought in, right? Removed from their, from their, 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 their backwards ways and brought into the, the settler project as Jews, right, as members of the national community, but also in many ways unseen, right? And I have a, an episode there, an episode in the book where Moshe Smilansky, who was um, um, the head of the Farmers Federation and an important chronicler and writer, also a, lit a literary um uh, author, um, he was talking about the founding of, of the of Rishon Lezion in 1882, and he described just an empty landscape of foxes howling. And then suddenly, 
he turns to his translator and he notes that this translator is among the natives of the land. And it's sort of clear from elsewhere that this is a Jewish translator because he goes and prays at some point in the story, right? So this translator is not present, right? There's simply the unmediated encounter with the Ashkenazi settler in the land. But then in that moment where he becomes convenient and necessary, this native Jew emerges as a critical actor, right? You can't purchase land without communication. You can't communicate without a translator. So, you know, I, I'm not sure I went as far with that type of analysis as perhaps I could or that somebody else might, but Mizrahi Jews or um, Sephardi and Oriental Jews were, were also part of this kind of hierarchy. I, may, I want to jump in on that point, if I may, um, and ask about the connection between your first Aliyah heroes, as it were, um, and um, uh, those who assumed uh, political, um, cultural, economic, and educational power after 1977, Hama Pach. Um, are they, that is to say, uh, the heirs of Menachem Begin's upending of the 30-year rule of the labor Zionists, the heirs um, of your first Aliyah protagonists um, in terms of their commitment to capitalism um, and perhaps other features of their putatively apolitical political agenda. Um, what is the connection? You, you know, your story is at it, is it once a story of fractured memory, um, uh, of an attempt to construct um, sort of a, a, a mythic image of the past um, ruptured at various points by uh, labor Zionists um, insertion of their own uh, very powerful uh, and and powerfully constructed narrative, but it's also it's also a story of continuity. Um, it's a story about the continuity uh, of of capitalism um, in the Zionist project. So I'm wondering how you see uh, the relation between um, uh, the first Aliyah and the post seventy seven Israel. Yeah, well, there's a, a few different, I guess, direct directions that I can take the, the conversation about post-77 Israel. So one important thing to recognize that I think is often forgotten, certainly in like survey courses of Israel about Israel and Zionism, is that the Likud party led by Menachem Begin at that time, who was a noted revisionist, was called Likud because it was formed as a, well, first they were trying to promote the idea of Jewish unity, but it was also formed through the combination of multiple parties. So it was not only the revisionists, it was also um, the liberal party, um, which represented a variety of um, private interests, including industrialists, business interests, and also um, some of these agriculturalist uh, private landowners were also part of this liberal um, party in the 1960s and kind of pr produced a kind of moderating effect, or, or at least the kind of radicalism associated with the revisionists was uh, perceived by many voters to be tempered by the involvement of these, you know, supposedly non-ideological folks who were interested in economic development, who felt that economic progress had been stifled by the kind of bureaucracy uh, and uh, control of, of Mapai. Um, and so, you know, is Begin the heir to the first Aliyah? Yeah, well, no, right? Because he's an heir to this revisionist story, which has its own trajectory. But is the Likud party as a whole, is this kind of marriage between right-wing interests and centrist or business or capitalist interests? Absolutely. And I think we forget about that lineage. Also in a much more concrete sense, when you look at the development of industrial capitalism in Israel from the British mandate and then into the, the state era, you can see all kinds of examples of individuals who either got their start as a business person by purchasing an orchard in Petah Tikva or Nesiona or Chadera or somewhere, and then later in their career go on to be the CEO of a company, um, and I have a variety of examples of this that that I could mention, um, where you know we could you know, we can like follow we can follow the money in a sense, right? Like money that gets initially invested in agriculture in these private colonies where individuals could invest private money, then grows right through the magic of capitalism into money that could be spent on other ventures. So there's that really direct set of connections that I think could be much further 
excavated, right? That was not the topic of my project. And then also in terms of sentiments, right? Narratives of the self, narratives of commitment to the Jewish nation beyond politics, the idea of technology or development being right, the most important uh, factor in the strength and future of the Jewish people. And we can see that certainly today when we look at especially outreach on the part of you know, Israeli, you know, PR towards American Jews who are liberal Zionists, not only some of them in the sense that they see themselves as liberal in the American sense, but also in the sense that they see themselves as liberal in the economic sense. Like they too like these visions of developing a society through innovation, through, you know, bringing progress um, to a society. So all of these things are possible through lines that I think have been quite obscured or at least are seen to be much more recent than I think they actually are. And as we're talking about errors and through lines, and we're moving forward in time from the first Aliyah itself through 1977 and through to today, I want to ask a question um, about how first Aliyah memory can speak to the current state of Israeli politics. And so to be able to do this, I want to first put two points on the table to keep in mind before I ask the question. Okay. So the first is that there is this idea of hierarchical coexistence which is that interpersonal and often capitalist ties are the best method to managing conflict between Zionists and Palestinians. So that's point one. Uh, and point two, um, second, is the idea that the first Aliyah narrative serves as an alternative for those who are excluded from the official state narrative that is labor Zionist in nature. And so when you put these two things together, I think it's possible to arrive at contemporary propositions by really newly powerful Israeli political actors who don't come out of the labor Zionist tradition, who believe very strongly that interpersonal projects often of economic natures between Israelis and Palestinians is the best way to use the phrasing of a very famous Israeli political philosopher, shrink the conflict. So for instance, I'm thinking about now current prime minister Naftali Bennett, who comes from the national religious camp very much, not part of labor Zionist memory, who is a strong endorser, a strong proponent of the idea that economic joint ventures between Israelis and Palestinians is not a long-term solution, but frankly, what they should be doing on the daily in order to manage what is happening. And so I'm wondering what you think in general about these contemporary resonances and how newly powerful actors are playing upon these memories in their current propositions. Yeah, I think it's a really important question. And, you know, of all things that I didn't think that I was going to have things to say about, like contemporary politics was not you know, that was not where I was going. And then I realized I need to write a conclusion to this book. And there are just so many resonances. Now, you know, if we drill down, there's important, right, change over time, right? But just in terms of these big patterns that, that you um, observe and that I observed and wrote about in a somewhat impressionist, impressionistic way in my conclusion, yes, right? Israel, Palestine today, right? The entire space of, of Israel and the West Bank is a space of, of, of interaction and mixing between um, Israelis and Palestinians. Some of those Palestinians are citizens and some of those Palestinians are non-citizens. The idea that Jews should only hire other Jews is still present in certain segments of the far right. And that's something that could be talked about, but broadly speaking, and especially in circles that would consider themselves moderate or pragmatic, are not especially political, you find lots of celebration of the kinds of good day-to-day -day relations that Jews have either with the Palestinians they hire or the Palestinians who serve them in different kinds of service roles, right? Tons of examples, right? Oh, me and my Palestinian painter, you know, or whatever, we get along, we get along really well. And why are these leftists coming in and imposing this vision of separation? Right, or telling us that there's something wrong with our relationship. Look, we have a relationship mediated by economic needs on both ends. They need a, a wage and I need whatever I need service done and we're all getting along better because of it. So you can see that playing out both in, in, in discourse among um, non-ideological settlers, even some settlers who would call themselves ideological, but also all sorts of Jews within the green line. Right. So in that sense, we have a continuity across these political spaces. Um, I think this kind of vision of an, a future of economic relationship rather than separation is, is part of what we're seeing. The end 
the slow sputtering end of the partition vision for Palestine that has dominated since the 1930s when the British first proposed it. The idea that you know two ethno-national groups necessarily should be mixing as little as possible for the benefit of everyone. Two mechanisms of thinking about what a shared space looks like. And when you look on the Israeli center and right, or center right, as it's often called, you see these visions of, 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 of uh, and also justifications of maintaining inequality within an ethnically divided and segregated, but still fundamentally shared space. And this was always in different iterations, the visions of the Zionist right right? Shrinking the conflict while maintaining control or gaining even further control of territory. So in that sense, we're looking at yet another developing iteration of a kind of thinking of managing conflict rather than separating people so as to kind of you know, mechanically um, pull them apart. Yeah, and we should also state plainly that the criticism, really the core thrust of the criticism against this model is the same today as it was in the early 20th century which is that it completely occludes the structural components here. So this focus on interpersonal ties really comes at the expense of looking at the structures and the systems that are also in play here. We saw that historically um, in the examples that you used that people were thinking like that in the 1930s and before, and that that is still today very much um, the core criticism, I think mostly from the left um, of this idea that interpersonal relationships can solve uh, the conflict. Absolutely, absolutely. And that ultimately, right, this process, all of the processes set in place by Jewish settlement are fundamentally good, and that they're not only fundamentally good for Jews, they're fundamentally good for everyone and for the land itself. And that anyone who doesn't recognize that or decides to protest or boycott or, or whatever, just doesn't understand, right? They're acting irrationally, they're acting against their own best interest, you know, look, you know, aren't they benefiting by having jobs? Um, so that's the critique is to say, is, is, is to say, well, this whole vision kind of denies the, even the possibility that this model of society through settlement could be anything but un, um, un, 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 unvarnished good. Well, this is a really interesting line of uh, conversation, but I'm afraid we have come to the end of our time. Um, we, um, had a really stimulating conversation and left so much uh, undiscussed uh, in this really beautifully restored call uh, Leora Halperin's The Oldest Guard Forging the Zionist Settler Past. Um, first, I'd like to thank uh, my, uh, uh, my colleague and student, uh, Avery Weinman, for participating in this conversation. Really wonderful to have you. Um, and thank you, Leora Halpern, for making time out of your schedule to talk about this really important piece of scholarship. It's really been a delight to have you uh, back, as it were, with us at UCLA. Thank you so much. Yes, there's a lot more to keep talking about that spins off of this. So thank you for helping start that. Yeah, so wonderful to be in conversation with you both today.